research integrity? Well, um, I'm sure different people will define research integrity in different ways or manners, but I mean, when you combine the word research and integrity together, um, it just shows that, to me, the content of your research must be original. The whole essence of doing research is to solve a particular problem that you have identified. In fact, that's why we are here as researchers and academics. So, um, research integrity involves, you know, tying your research to a particular problem. And then, at the end of the research work, you must have solutions or what you call research outputs that try to address that problem. It's not a one-stop thing sometimes, that you conduct one research and you're able to solve that problem once and for all, no. Sometimes research goes on for sometimes as long as five, ten years before you finally come out with um, the desired solution. But integrity um, also is very important in carrying out research because we have seen a lot of situations where people plagiarize, copy other people's work and claim to be their own original work. It's a crime in the academic um, uh, you know, environment and it is um, something that must be totally uh, discouraged. So research integrity involves carrying out, you know, conceiving a problem, carrying out an original research to solve that problem and at the end of the day you come out with original solutions that you can attribute to be the output of your work. Of course sometimes it is possible to borrow ideas from other researchers or even borrow from their processes or methodologies that they have adopted in the past. Um, there's no crime about that. But there are rules of engagement that guide a researcher, you know, in using other people's work or products. In that situation, you must seek some, you know, approval, uh, permission to use such procedures. And again, it is ethical that at the end of the research work, you must acknowledge such procedures and researchers whose works or you know ideologies you have used you know, in trying to carry out your own research. So this is basically what I, I, I can explain to me, you know, research integrity. And of course, um, you must not cook results. And that's what I meant by, you know, um, your results must be original, as original as the problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah. So it all boils down to originality. Originality. It's very important in research. Uh, well, groundbreaking, um, that's, a, that's a tall one, but I would say yes, um, uh, in my 26 years, almost three decades of research activity or engagement in the university, I joined the university in 1994 as a graduate assistant. Of course, when you are a young academic, it's a totally different ball game. Um, you know, there's a popular dogma here in Obafemiola University, you publish or perish. Because it's, it, it was perceived, you know, as a young academic at that time, that the only thing that can earn you promotion is the number of papers and publications that you have. But um, that is not totally true. Uh, there are other aspects of, um, you know, there are other criteria that can be used to assess uh, researchers or academic staff, you know, to earn um, promotion. So, yes. Um, I will say towards the beginning of my career as an academic, um, I won't say I have been involved in too much of, you know, groundbreaking research activities because at that time as a graduate assistant, assistant lecturer, you're under the tutelage of some other more senior academics who will mentor you and guide you on the research methodologies and all that. But as you grow older in the system, I mean, in the last, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years, for instance, by the time I had assumed the position of a senior lecturer. So the, the, your, your maturity in conducting independent research changes. And at that time, you begin to have more focus on problem solving, um, you know, uh, research activities. So yes, I have um, been involved in some groundbreaking research activities that has led to patents right now. Uh, in the last three years, since 2017, on a yearly basis, I've been very consistent in, you know, uh, carrying out research activities whose outputs have been, you know, patented. And of course, the most groundbreaking is uh, the one patented in 2018, which, um, you know, um, has taken me around the world and is internationally recognized. I can talk more about that. In 
Yes. Um, the when I was placing the uh, preparing the patent document, of course, the title I gave it that was some uh, three four years ago now um, was a multi-purpose, multi-pass conductive rotary dryer for um, drying granular agricultural materials. Um, it's a dryer, a rotary dryer, different from most other imported dryers uh, that you'll see around, okay, uh, which are very expensive and sometimes very complex. Um, so this dryer actually can dry a different variety of crops because drying is key to agricultural uh, you know, productive, productivity. I'm sure you'll agree with me. You, grow, you go around Nigeria, especially in the suburb um, areas, you find farmers and food processors you know, drying their produce on roadsides, on rooftops. It's even worse in the rural communities where there are no drying facilities. So this is the problem that we try to solve by developing this technology. But today, um, since 2018 that we got that patent, and now, um, of course, it won some national award at that time. And of course, the uh, technology was also shortlisted in 2019, which was just last year, as one of the best innovations in um, Africa. Um, I was shortlisted among the best um, 16 innovators, uh, shortlisted for the Africa Prize for um, Engineering Innovation. And since then, it's been from one thing to the other. So I've gotten some funding support from some international donors to improve because you see you have to keep improving technology um, so today the name is different from the name you know we gave it some three four years ago it's today called the 3d 3p uh, conductive rotary dryer yeah um the the raw materials and the Raw Material Research and Development Council, which is an agency under the Nigeria Federal Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, based in Abuja, were the first um, um, motivators for the project, I would say, because uh, there is always this national call for researchers. It's more like a challenge, like a competition among academics. If you have a research output um, that you feel is worth you know, um, you know, uh, competing in the market, you come out with it and all that. So the first time we had our opportunity uh, was in 2008, when the technology actually won the best um, innovation award in Nigeria in 2008. So it was a mandate of the Federal Ministry of Science and Tech at that time that any such award-winning uh, research output must be funded by government. So we got some seed capital from the Raw Materials Research and um, Development Council, um, you know, uh, some prize money and then some further visit capital to be able to support the actual production. So from the grants that we got from Raw Materials, we were able to develop the very first version of the technology. But subsequently, uh, since 2019, that the same technology won an international award uh, from the Royal Academy of Engineering in UK, We've also gotten some additional, you know, training and the seed capital to further continue to improve on the uh, technology. Yes, at the beginning, because this is a research work, I mean, you know, that dates back to 2008. Um, so 2008 to date is, I mean, well over a decade. So at the beginning of the work, because these are actually offshoots of my PhD work, um, so at the early stage of the research activity, of course, I can say it was a standalone project. I was more or less like the, you know, um, egghead, uh, conceptualized the design, tried to put it together. But I must say that I've ha had um, a lot of uh, collaborative support from my students, some of whom have also graduated uh, today. So, but as time went by, especially since last year that the team you know got this international um, visibility yeah so i've had one or two you know people in india uh, in kenya who are actually interested in working um, with me in trying to see how the technology can also be adapted in other parts of um, the country but there are still issues ar around 
you know, getting regional patents. So don't just let out such a technology that is only patented in Nigeria. And the moment it gets out of the shores of the country, of course, you can lose the uh, intellectual property completely. So we're still having issues around that. Um, and that is one other area that I think your office must begin to uh, look towards supporting such internationally recognized um, research outputs for regional, I'm sure there are, there are all kinds of regional patenting organizations, and also the World uh, Intellectual Property Organization. So um, to me, this is the next phase of, of, of my work, which is you know, the next challenge, really. <sighs> yes. Um, yeah. Obviously, I, I, I am um, always motivated and I also want to believe that every other researcher is motivated by trying to solve problems. Um, especially in the agricultural sector, in sub-Saharan countries, have a lot of um, similarities in the, in the agricultural sector. Uh, we know what damage the oil boom and the oil industry has um, cost uh, to us intellectually all right let me put it that way of course we are generating a lot of revenue from oil but now the oil is dwindling and we have failed you know over time to diversify our economy but you know i mean with the advent of covid19 the government is now forced to look towards agriculture so um there's a big a lot of challenges in the agricultural sector there are a lot of problems that require solving but my biggest motivation actually comes from working with local rural farmers. Um, I work around in the rural villages, in the rural communities, and it's just a very pitiable sight how these local people produce palm oil, how these local people produce gari, which 90% of the population in Nigeria actually depend upon for consumption. You can imagine how locals being Iru that we all put in our soup is produced. So when you watch these local people, the way they produce their stuff, I mean, you, you're only dumbfounded. And the next thing is that, look, you must th this things continue this way. And this is the way their own forefathers taught them to do it 50, 60 years ago. And they're still doing their thing the same way that their parents, their forefathers did it 50 years ago. So, where, what, what, so what is the role of those of us who are scientists, who are engineers, who are agricultural engineers? So there must be a way by which we must improve upon the local practices and attitudes of these people, these rural people. That's the first motivation. The second motivation also comes from the fact that, look, why is it that we must depend on foreign engineers like us from China, from Europe, you know, to bring in technologies to us. And then of course we lose a lot of foreign exchange today. So there are a lot of products made in China today that are all over the places in Nigeria, which Nigerian engineers can actually do, produce. So this is another motivating factor to say, look, I mean, we've been to some of these countries and we know that the people, the engineers there, the scientists there are not really too far better than us. All right, but of course we agree that there are certain constraints um, so these are my major motivating factors, trying to help local farmers solve their problems and then also trying to see why we must reduce dependence on foreign technologies, on imported technologies. Um, I mean, like I said, um, after winning the, um, after being shortlisted for the Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation last year, that gave the technology, the 3D 3 period to draw a lot of international global visibility. And um, since then, um, we've been trying to see how to, uh, because you see, most of the time your research output is useless if it is not used by anybody. And I think right now the government is also trying to make effort to commercialize this product until the, the research output becomes a product it is useless. So um, what I have done um, is to take a step further and build a business, a startup business around the technology. As a matter of fact, that's what got me into the Africa Prize uh, competition last year. And um, so uh, since then, I've received a lot of um, support, technical assistance, trainings on investor readiness and all that. So right now, what we're trying to do is to build an industry around this technology. And what is that industry? 
The dryer, like I said, is very efficient, cheaper than any other imported dryer. And um, so what we're trying to do now is we collect um, wet brewer's grains from the breweries, which is a waste byproduct, waste in quotes, all right? Um, but we know that once this waste product is properly dried, as quickly as possible, it becomes a very rich resource that can be used for the production of animal feed. Today, the biggest challenge in the livestock industry is the feed because of the increasing cost of maize. So it has been found that this, uh, uh, um, um, you know, brewer's grain, which is like a waste, once it is properly dried, you know, can be used to substitute maize and reduce the cost of, um, you know, livestock production. And thereby, it will also help to reduce the cost of animal-based protein like eggs, chicken meat, beef, pork, name it fish, and all that, which basically we all depend upon to get for our daily, you know, protein and consumption. So, uh, this is the industry we are trying to build around now. Right now, of course, one or two investors around the world are interested in putting their funds into it so that we can use this technology to actually establish an industry where in the future thousands, hundreds and thousands of our youths, young engineers can, you know, be, uh, you know, uh, gainfully uh, employed and also learn in the process of, um, you know, trying to, like, industrialize, you know, research um, outputs. Yes, um, I mean, <laughs> if you look at the feed, the technology, like I said, is multipurpose. It's not only applicable to one particular crop. You can use it to dry your maize, you can use it to dry your rice, you can use it to dry whatever kind of grains. We are also trying to see how to adapt it to other non-grain products, okay? Um, okay, so the research goes on and on. So definitely the uh, target um, end users are our local farmers who dry their produce using different uh, sun drying methods. And of course, sun drying becomes a problem during rainy season because they lose, they cannot dry, uh, the thing gets moldy and then they lo lose a lot of money. And of course, a lot of their produce and of course, a lot of time wasted and all that in drying. So, these are generally our target, um, um, you know, um, end users, yes. But because of the capital intensive nature of the technology, sometimes we're also trying to see how we can bring cooperative farmers together. I mean, probably have a group of 10, 15, 20 farmers who have enough capital to be able to purchase this technology. Then we can get it installed for them. And then they can, of course, bring their produce in bits and dry. And that way we can have some you know, um, yeah, social impact. But of course, our um, ultimate target is also the guys who are working in the industry, not just the local farmers. There are people who have money, who have capital, and they don't know uh, they don't they don't know what to do with the money. Okay, so I mean, those are called investors, and these are the kinds of another category of um, you know people that we are talking to right now. Bring your money, let us partner, set up this industry. Of course, we are going to make money out of it, so you have your own dividends, and I have mine. And of course, um, we also have a lot of social impacts, creating jobs, reducing poverty, uh, you know, so to say, meeting the, some of the sustainable development goals. Well, yes, I don't see any reason why, from everything that I've said, if anyone is listening to me, I don't see any reason why I mean, the major stakeholders, for instance, in the Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, the Raw Materials Research and Development Council, we have Smedan, Small and Medium Enterprise um, Development Agency of Nigeria. We have so many agencies, you know, under the Federal Ministry of Science and Technology, even outside the Ministry of Science and Technology, who should be interested in this? Because um, right now, Nigeria is emphasizing on diversification of the economy moving away from oil to other sectors. And Greek is, of course, one of the you know, most vulnerable sectors from where. So um, um, this is a model that we're trying to put in place to serve as an example of how the research output from the university can actually you know, you know, gain um, access into the market use the same um, output to set up an industry 
where hundreds and thousands of youths you know can be working and today this is the this is the focus of government so um, I'm hoping the government can get interested in this kind of project and I'm sure just like my research outputs there are mm, thousands and thousands of other research outputs there lying in the shelves in various universities across Nigeria that are not being taken up uh, but I'm just lucky that with the kind of strategies that I have used to take my technology my research output out of the shelf into the market and of course building on that industry for growth and um, you know development. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very, um, very jamming question. Um, you know, we started with the what I understood by research integrity, and I think this point is really very important. Um, Generally, among academics, the general dogma or belief is that you perish, you publish, or you perish. And I have always never agreed with that um, philosophy. Um, it's not only by publishing that you can be promoted. So you, you, you don't, um, I mean, for instance, not until in my faculty, for instance, I, I probably was one of the few people who have gotten promoted just because I had two patents when I was going to be promoted to become an associate professor in the university. It generated some bit of argument and all that, but it's in our books, it's in the law of the university that you have patents that can contribute substantially to the criteria you know, for your promotion. So, um, and so this dogma is actually what drives a lot of researchers and that's, to me, um, you know, lacks integrity. Because when you have this mad rush for publishing so that you can quickly get promoted, you lose content, you lose integrity, so to say. Because the whole essence of trying to carry out research is not so that you can become promoted to become a professor, but it is so that primarily so that you can solve problems. So, and that's why you have a situation today where we have loads and loads of professors in the university system, and we're not solving problems out there. They have carried out nice research works. They have done good research works. But the point is that how many of those research outputs are known to those farmers out there? What impact are these research outputs making on the lives of people, but also, you know, conducting research for the exact purpose for which research is meant? Research is not meant for promotion, it is meant to solve problems. But in the process of that, you get promoted. That is my perception of um, you know, what we should be doing as academics. Wow. <laughs> like I've said, I mean, I have a lot of um, uh, people who are interested already. Uh, just two weeks ago, I'm um, talking to a friend in India um, who produces all kinds of um, wares like this, uh, you know, kitchen utensils, cups, tea cups, coffee cups. From what? From um, Brewer's Grain. And so when we met in a webinar in a, an international conference recently, he was he got so interested, you know, um, hearing that okay, we have a dry because their major challenge in India is you know um, you know um, drying this product quickly and to the appropriate quality. So we got engaged and today we are talking business. Uh, so he's interested. And of course, um, the wide majority of people who are involved in the brewer's grain business in Nigeria today do so manually. If we go to the whole area of Alakia in Ibadan, you know, just our neighboring um, community here, I mean, a lot of people are already involved in doing this thing, but manually using sun drying. And it's because there is no technology for drying this produce. So, I mean, they are also part of my primary target that later on when we're able to build this industry, some of it can come, pick up, because our product is far, far, you know, um, better in terms of quality, in terms of uh, quantity of production, in terms of, um, you know, other criteria that you can use to access the quality. Uh, because what these people do is that after they go to the breweries, they collect the waste, dry it in their own traditional local method, and then they bag it, they package, and then take them to the feed mills, like Top Feeds in the Badon, for instance, who now mixes this product with other things like maize 
another to produce their own livestock feed. All right, so most of the time they face rejection because of the poor quality. And you know, you can compare something that you're spreading on the ground to dry with something that you now dry mechanically. The quality is far better. And of course, right now we have an MOU with the, um, with the feed mills themselves who are also interested um, you know, in taking up this uh, product uh, from us. So the brewery industry is interested, the feed mill industry is interested, the middlemen who do the drying are also very interested. But most importantly, I believe that our farmers should be interested in the technology. Yeah. You know, the same thing, the same old story. Um, the biggest challenge that any researcher faces in Nigeria today, of course, will be attributed to funding. Uh, poor funding is, is number one, but um, I, I, I have a, a, a bit of a different um, you know, approach to solving that funding problem. Um, that's number one. Number two is also the, uh, um, let me say, non-institutional support. I mean, yes, we must, I mean, while conducting research, yes, you're receiving your salary, which is a good enough support. But it, is, it shouldn't get to a point where you must use your salary in doing research. And if you want to carry out meaningful research in this university, you must spend your salary, which is not supposed to be so. Because you're not getting grants from anywhere. You're not getting funding from anywhere. Of course, I know that the university has uh, some uh, research funds, faculty research funds, for instance, which are just seed capital to support researchers. But that is far from being enough to conduct a real, meaningful, impactful research work. So um, I, I, I want to wish, compared to like universities in South Africa, for instance, I have a lot of friends who are researchers there. They get a lot of institutional support, even for publishing good quality paper in a reputable international journal. You get some compensation, you get some, some, you get some payment for that. You got a patent in a university, you got some payment for that. So that encourages a lot of that. And that's what I mean by institutional support. All right. Um, so not just to use your papers for promotion, but to also get appreciation from the university that you are working for, that you are well done. There must be a way by which the university should tell researchers, well done. Because it's not easy to conduct research for many years and get it to the market. It's a lot of, you know, wahala or challenges, you know. Um, like I was saying, yeah. How did you overcome challenges peculiar to this uh, research? Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, I, I differentiated myself somehow uh, because I'm the kind of person who personally doesn't give up um, even in the face of challenges. Once I believe in something, okay, I just do anything to make sure that I move on and I get the problem solved. And that is what has driven me. So I spend a lot of my personal savings. Um, in doing research and a lot of my students know me for that. Um, of course, I've been lucky to get one or two funding sources, supports, like uh, for the one I got from the Raw Materials Research and Development Council, which actually gave me the opportunity to build the very first version to make my concept, you know, materialize. And that is what has led me to where uh, I am today. So uh, that's one. Two, um, more recently, that I have also won international awards. I've gotten more and more of international support in terms of technical assistance because sometimes we make a mistake and think that funding is just the only thing. No. Sometimes lack of idea may just be the bigger challenge. You have the money to do this or you are given the money to do this but if you don't have the appropriate, the right idea to carry out the research, it's going to end up as a failure. So it's a combination of factors you know, that makes you successful in um, you know, conducting um, cutting-edge research, um, uh, like I would say. So local support, yes, uh, but more of international support right now. But I wished that we had more institutional support. Uh, that, that was the content of a proposal that I just sent to an international organization um, two months ago. They asked exactly the same question and definitely the answer is I want to see 
uh, the first mechanized drying plant for spent grains which I have built. It's the first of its kind in Nigeria on the basis of the same technology. Um, we have a pilot plant right now. Like I said, we have built a business around it and I think that is another approach that we can use. I have to set up a business around it because that is only when investors will listen to you. Investors are not going to listen to you because you're a professor in the university. They know you as a teacher or as a researcher. But they're going to listen to you more when you go to them as the founder or the CEO of a business, of a company, around which, I um, mean, um, the core of which is your research output. And that model seems to be working for me. So, right now, I mean, we're looking for as much as $800,000 within the next one year. And we already have two investors. They're ready to raise $400,000 to pour into the business and so in the next five years we want to see a big industry we want to see a situation where wherever there's a brewery we put our plants next to it we take up their waste convert it it's like a waste to wealth project take up their waste convert it to something that the livestock industry needs a simple model which i believe um, is, is something that's going to scale very very fast because the reactions and responses that I've gotten from some of these investors is quite encouraging. Research integrity is very important. And by research integrity, to me, it's not only when you steal somebody's ideas or somebody's research outputs that um, you have lacked integrity. No. Um, a lot of people misconceive research integrity to mean that I you go and steal that because we've had quite a number of such things, and that's why plagiarism is um, is is is, is, a, is a terminology attributed to academics or researchers. So we've had situations, ugly situations, when uh, some researchers will go and steal some other people's work, you know, repackage it, and then present it as their own original work. And that's what I meant initially at the onset that about originality in research. We must try. We must strive. And you see, once you have identified a problem and you're trying to solve it originally, honestly, within your heart, and of course you put resources together to provide to prefer that solution, then you have integrity. And then of course, the final part of it is that your solution, I mean your research output must be targeted towards you know, solving a specific problem. And if that problem has not been solved, then you are yet to be there, all right? But of course, sometimes, you know, solving problems is a long process, it's a long chain of um, activities. And like I said earlier on, it may take as long as five, 10 years sometimes. It's just like developing a COVID-19 vaccine. I mean, it took, took some researchers quite a number of, um, you know, months since uh, the onset of the virus to start, you know, discussing some, you know, vaccines now. So. Uh, that's exactly the same kind of integrity that we must that must play out, you know, um, in research. It's difficult. It's not easy, really. But and that's why you know people try to cut corners just because you want to become a professor quickly, and this research output is not giving you what you want, and then you want to do something very quickly, or you know, recycle data or something just to get there. I am. Um, I differ from, from that. It doesn't matter whether it takes me the next 20 years to become a professor. But in the next five years, I want to see an industry built around my research output. That gives me more satisfaction. Um, I belong to quite a number of um, local organizations. Uh, the first that comes to mind is my professional organization, um, the Nigerian Institution of Agricultural Engineers that I've been in the last uh, 15 years or so, because I also belong to the <clears throat> Nigerian Society of Engineers, um, a current registered um, engineer. Um, I belong to the American Society of Agriculture and Biosystems Engineering. And of course, more recently, <clears throat> I am a member of the um, African Prize for Engineering Innovation Alumni, which today is a very, very strong body you know, promoting the frontiers of knowledge in engineering research and application. 
Yeah, tremendously. Uh, there's no doubt that you know belonging to professional organizations sure have some impact on your performance as a researcher and also on the quality of your output. So, um, of course, like I said, I will, I will be forever grateful to the Royal Academy of Engineering in UK that are that have seemed to be my greatest um, pillar um, in the last um, you know 24 months. Um, They've given me a lot of support, morally, financially, and um, you know, technically as well. <clears throat> so, and these are ingredients that are very, very important for any um, you know successful uh, researcher. So, definitely, I mean, these professional bodies have impacted positively on my career as a researcher, and more recently as an industrialist, <laughs> yeah, trying to apply. The, um, the you know the technology in the industry that's what I mean yeah yeah of course the challenges are obvious just like it has affected every other sector um, I mean the, the 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 biggest effects the biggest immediate effects was the closure of universities around the world not just in Nigeria okay so that kind of paralyzed the activities of research um, which was a big challenge. Uh, but again, it's a challenge and you have to keep revolving around the challenge, maneuvering and trying to, as you're trying to keep yourself safe, you also want, don't want to lose focus, complete focus, you know, on your primary calling, which is conducting research. And of course, um, the work of trying to industrialize or commercialize this research product had to stop at some point um, around April. May of the year, shortly after the lockdown. Uh, so this did a blow on, on the project. But again, like I said, the, I've enjoyed the support of the Real Academy of Engineering in the UK so tremendously that they also helped businesses around Africa um, to kind of pivot around their core businesses. And um, of course, I'm one of the 26 Africans um, that were recently, you know, supported by the UK government to pivot. Uh, we got some funding in terms of um, equipment uh, to now start, rather than focus on your core research area, you can now start to, you know, produce uh, PPEs, personal protective equipment, to re respond to COVID-19. So I'm one of those beneficiaries, and I'm, I, I can proudly tell you today that I have a state-of-the-art 3D. Uh, printing and uh, vacuum forming laboratory here in the university uh, in my department. Um, I'm grateful to the university, of course, for offering me the space where that um, you know laboratory is not domiciled. Of course, a lot of young students are now benefiting from the from the project. So uh, the challenges, but now that COVID-19 is uh, more or less um, you know giving way. I mean, at least vaccines have been uh, <laughs> developed. So we are also hoping that uh, 2021 will be, you know, a, a great year. But of course, despite the challenges, COVID-19 has also brought about other opportunities that I am not trying to take advantage of. It has led me to now refocus my research into additive manufacturing, circular engineering and all that, which I never thought of earlier on, but which the challenges of COVID-19 actually, you know, um, you know, helped to conceptualize and today I'm trying to also you know bring in students to work with me in that area. Yeah upcoming researchers I mean younger colleagues in the university I I, I, I want to tell them that doing research solving problems to me is probably one of the most satisfying thing that anyone can engage in. Of course Everybody also wants to make money. Everybody wants to live a good life. Everybody wants to be comfortable. You want to be able to send your kids to very good schools and all that. So these are some of the challenges that young academics will face. That's because poor facilities in the university, poor um, you know, um, effort from government to you know, aid research and all that. And of course, poor payment, poor pay. You know? So um, young academics or young researchers will be faced with these problems. I mean, I was faced with the same set of problems some 25 years ago. Uh, but the uh, words of encouragement is that they should not give up. 
um, one way or the other, they will find a way of, you know, uh, you know, surmounting, you know, uh, these challenges. And to me, one of the greatest ways of solving or, you know, um, surmounting these challenges is by trying to build partnerships with people outside the university system, with people in the industry. At least in my class of uh, 89 sets, graduating sets in 89, I can say maybe just two of us or three of us are now working in the academic environment. The remaining 80 or 90 percent are in the industry. So you must link up with these people. And you never can tell. One or two of them will just be interested in what you're doing and they are ready to provide funding support, you know, to conduct such a research work. So what I'm trying to say now is that we must look intently outside sources from government to fund research activities and to enjoy a good life because it's important for researchers to enjoy a good life. Otherwise, your brain becomes rusty and it just won't deliver.